Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to the Ohio Fisherman. I came up here to a tributary of Lake Erie to do a little steelhead fishing today. This is going to be the Steelhead 101 video. I'm going to go over a little bit of the natural history of steelhead. A little bit of the natural history of steelhead. Uh, the history of steelhead in Ohio. Where to go to catch them and exactly what you use to catch them. Now, you know, many of you know I only get one, maybe two days off a week. Uh, it's been pouring rain coming up here this morning. The flows are fishable really good. I'm just worried about crossing over to the other side. It doesn't come up too much, but I'll just keep it on the flow chart. I think I'll be all right. The rain slacked off massively, but definitely got to keep an eye on the flow chart so I can get back across. Anyways, um, if you guys watch a couple of my videos, you do like my content, hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you a dime. You can turn that notification bell on or off. If you'd like to be notified about my content, um, at least hit that like button. You know, it really helps me out. And I really do appreciate those of you that hit the subscribe button. You know, it's, I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, patronizing me by taking a second to hit that like button. But I need to get across this river here. I was the first guy here, but uh, I got to get across and get set up, ready for it to get light out. Well, while we're sitting here along the riverside, waiting for the sun to come up, let's go over that natural history of steelhead. So, what are steelhead? Are they a rainbow trout? Kind of. Not really. I mean, rainbow trout are native to uh, British Columbia, Alaska. I believe there's a strain in Washington called Red Band, but uh, rainbow trout are a landlocked trout. Steelhead are actually an ocean run fish like salmon. Steelhead come from the Pacific Ocean. They were introduced into the Great Lakes. Steelhead are not native here. Um, their life cycle is <clears throat> normally they run upstream after the salmon kind of near the tail end of the salmon. The salmon run upstream, steelhead run upstream behind them. And that's one of the main reasons why eggs work so good for them. Or flies or anything kind of orange, reddish, pinkish, chartreuse. Especially eggs. God, they love eggs. But why those work so good is the steelhead, when they follow up, you know, salmon... When salmon spawn, they die. Steelhead do not. Steelhead come up, and while the salmon are spawning and dying, the steelhead eat the salmon eggs. They eat the decaying salmon flesh. That's why they like this so much. Because they're a natural habitat in the Pacific Ocean. They're following them up, and they're feeding off their eggs and their bodies as they decompose. Because salmon or steelhead, whoo, it's chilly out. They stay in these rivers all winter long. Now, they don't all come up at the same time. They kind of straggle up. <clears throat> they start coming up uh, all about the end of September. September, they kind of start cruising the shorelines. They start coming up. And um, they start staging at river mouths. And then when you start getting the cold rains and the cold pushes, that's when they start coming in. That is when the salmon or the steelhead start coming into the rivers and they're a nice bright chrome. They're fresh. That's when people like to eat them. I don't care too much for the flavor. So they'll start migrating up these rivers and they will go up these rivers as far as they can. Literally, they will go up all these rivers and all these tributaries of Lake Erie as far as they can go. And they don't die. They will stay in here and they will change colors. They'll start, um, you know, losing a lot of body fat because there's not so much for here to eat as compared out uh, onto the big lake where they're out there eating shad and smell, walleye, everything. Because they grow... So lake Erie steelhead grow, what is it, uh, two to three pounds a year out on the lake. That is pretty intense. <clears throat> so they will come up these rivers, and they will hang out all winter long. 
and then they will spawn in the spring. Uh, the males will make beds, what they call in the trout world, reds. Uh, the males will make the reds. Boy, they get these beautiful pink stripes on them. And they'll spawn, and then they head back out to the lake. Normally by the end of the May, they will all be back out onto the lake. And you can't really fish for them. They head back out deep. They go out to the eastern basin of Lake Erie and hold out there really deep, just gorging themselves on other fish. Now, Ohio has tried stocking other things before steelhead. They've tried salmon programs and all these tributaries. They used to have cohos for a while. And, you know, they've tried rainbows. And, uh, you know, rainbows are they're just rainbows. I mean, if... If you fish, you know what stocked rainbows are. They're just crazy. Well, you know what? The first steelhead I ever caught was actually on power bait on the bottom uh, way back in 1999. Actually, that was my first time ever going, getting into steelhead. There was no internet then, just at AOL, and I heard about them through the grapevine. And I said, you know what? I'm going to try to find these fish. So... So I uh, spent a lot of time trying to find these. And, and the Grand River uh, is where I actually got my first one. And it was just tight lining power bait off the bottom. And I got some on rooster tails too. But uh, it took me a while trying to figure them out. And uh, finally started getting into them. So now you know a little bit about the life cycles of them. Um, let's get into where to go. Now... We stock these steelhead, okay? Um, there is a slight amount of natural reproduction. They actually do reproduce at a decent rate, but, you know, uh, Michael, um, oh, his last name's eluding me right now. He's the head of uh, Cleveland Metro Parks Fisheries, Durlek. Uh, I, boy, it's just slipped my mind right now. Uh, I was seeing some things he was doing, some... Uh, netting surveys and some of the feeder creeks and the steelhead actually do get a decent spawn those little baby steelhead were so cute too but one of the main problems is, is our rivers get too warm and and they just can't make it through those warm months you know they they just can't do it but so we stock in smolt you know what are they, i think like six to nine inch steelhead um our strain came from uh little manistee in michigan we used to trade them channel cats for them now i believe we raise them by ourselves and stock them <clears throat> so they stock in those smolts which are what they're called smolts um into the furthest west river and this is the current time frame 2023 the furthest w west river that they stock is the vermilion and then the rocky and then the chagrin and then the Grand, and then the Astabula, and then the Conneaut. And the furthest east that you go, the better. Because like I said, these fish, they hold out there in the eastern basin. And and they normally, they do try to go back to the same rivers. But I mean, you'll catch these fish in unstocked rivers also. Um, I'm not going to go through the list of those. And the numbers are definitely not as good. I do fish one unstocked river, and I do okay. I just fish it because it's close to my house. It's really hard to fish. Um, but the further east you go, because PA stocks a hell of a lot of... Uh, they got some crazy strains of trout. They just throw everything in. Uh, we even tried browns here in Ohio, too, but we didn't get a good return on those at all. We just weren't getting the numbers back in. So <clears throat> the furthest east you go is definitely better. Um, but you can have a banger day at any of these rivers. Well, I, you know, it's pouring here. My phone's getting soaked. I'm going to finish this up a little bit later. Waiting for it to get light out. Going to try to get some footage of some uh, fish in here. You know, hopefully I don't get stuck here. But hope you guys are enjoying the video. Don't forget, like I said, if you've watched a couple of my videos, you like my content, hit that sub button. I would really appreciate that. And all you folks that have, you know, thank you. Hot dang, I, I couldn't wait for a dark. I hooked up a cannonball. Lord and behold, I got a nice three pounder here. That's how a three pounder looks right there in the net. Yeah, wow, awesome. 
Awesome, that's my first steelhead in the dark. Awesome, unbelievable. Wow, that's so cool. Well, Trout, thanks for being my first steelhead after dark. See you, buddy. Thank you. So when I say cannonball, I'm talking big quarter size spawn sack there. Uh, tied those up for fishing in muddy water. Got uh, two different sizes here. I got ones that I roll up in the four inch, which are the cannonballs. And then the ones I roll up in the three inch, which are kind of normal size there. All right, I'm gonna try to get another one. That's awesome. Now this water has gotten muddy, muddy, muddy. It has definitely rose up since I've been here. I set that up as a marker about a foot away from the water. It started coming up. My dude Bruce showed up. I've only hooked in the one other fish. I don't know if I'm gonna get anything else. I'm just turned in the mud. But like I said, my only day off. Um, finish up the video later, I'll get into how to actually catch them. What you actually need to do to catch those. Uh, I'll wrap that up in a different section of the video. Whew, man, got, got right across that river in the nick of time. Man, it, it came up on me pretty good getting back across there. Whew, just taking a little breather here. So, you know, while the river's coming up here and it definitely turned the mud, let's talk about one very important thing, flow. Flow charts. How to judge the rivers, how to know the different rivers, the different flows for different rivers. Well, they start off, um, I got a whole video about this, but since it helps out with steelhead big time, we'll go over it. There's different gauge boxes on a lot of these rivers uh, that judges, uh, you've probably seen them, different boxes, heights, gauges, um, cubic foot per second is really what you're going for. Oh, there's Bobber over there. Yeah, Bobber. Cubic foot per second is what you're going for. And um, like this river, when I started off here today, it was at 445 optimal for this river is right about 400 um, the max that I'd fish it would be 600 when I checked it to walk back across it said 597 <clears throat> I said yeah better get out of here so just within a couple hours and it's not even raining anymore it went from 445 to 600 and uh this is a muddy 600 now it's um like if it was coming down after a couple days like this river clears up faster has less tributaries every river is different um <clears throat> but to find out the flow charts you would just put in like usgs uh rocky river usgs chagrin river usgs <clears throat> flow chart uh the grand river and it'll show you gauge heights is you'll learn the finagle it it'll show you the mean the median and <clears throat> you'll be able to figure out the different flows and that can save you a trip because if it's real nasty out you don't there's no point in coming like right now i wouldn't drive up here to fish this right now it's i put on a cannonball here uh i'm gonna try fishing this little beach hole right here a little bit that's because i'm up here and i don't want to go home i want to hang out on the river uh, so that's the flow charts all of them have their different flows you know what I mean some of them don't have them like uh, the Ashtabula doesn't have it I don't think the Connie has it well, I don't even drive out that far anyways I mainly just fish three rivers because I don't really want to drive more than an hour you know even though like I said the further east you go is better but maybe one day I'll head out there and hit the Connie out or the Ash on a weekday to take a little time off work, you know. So, yeah, now you talk about flows and uh, what baits to use. Like I was showing earlier, this is a cannonball. Look at that, that's that's a quarter size spawn sack right there. Um, that's muddy stained water like this, muddy water. If it was just slightly stained, like I was showing you before in the video, I got a smaller size cannonballs those I make with the three inch thread those I make with the four inch thread 
Now, when it comes to baits, um, we're going to go ahead and talk about in the rivers. You know, uh, drift fishing in the rivers. It's cold. They're not chasing baits. They're not chasing rooster tails. They're not chasing spoons. Um, they're not chasing husky jerks. They're, they're not really, they're so cold, you know, their metabolism. So I'm not saying it won't happen. It will. Um, but your best bet is going to be getting a drift, drift fishing. So let's go over some of the baits for that. So we went over the spawn sacks, uh, the really big ones and your heavily stained, uh, muddy water, the smaller ones in, um, you know, the lighter stained, stained water, um, even into clear, really, really, uh, small spawn sacks. And I have another video up about how to make spawn sacks. So if you want to find that, you can find that. But when it comes down to your clear water, this is what we got. We got beads, beads, and more beads. I know. Sounds crazy, right? But remember, we talked about the eggs, the salmon eggs, and the life cycle, them eating the salmon eggs. So you see I got different colors here. Uh, different colors, depends on what they want. You know, a lot of those, like those right there, those are 10 millimeter. Like in that mottled peach right there, those are 10 millimeter and 8 millimeter sizes. Like you can see over here in kind of the glow uh, peach, I got some 10s uh, and some 6s. And this one, I got some 10s, some 6s, and 8s in there. Those would be 10 and 8s, 10 and 8s, 10, 8, and 6s. <clears throat> so you can kind of see what color patterns I like. Now what I used to always throw in the more clear and very lightly stained water was flies even on my noodle rod i got away from the fly rod it's fun and all but <clears throat> drifting with a drift rod is much more successful um, in most circumstances so but i always used uh, the sucker spawn and uh, uh just a glow dot blood dot whatever they call it real easy patterns to tie uh, you can look those up and figure those patterns out. <clears throat> but these are the beads, and you're wondering, how do you attach those beads? You know, if, well, some people tie a knot around them, but you can go with a toothpick, or you can go with these called trout bead pegs. Um, you know, they're really soft plastic, and it's kind of like a toothpick, as you can see. They're tapered, fatter in the middle. You can get two uses out of them. You know, one on each side, slide it up till it's tight and clip out the ends. You could use a toothpick, but these are soft plastic, so you're not really going to get your line pinched so much with those. And that's how you would attach those. And you attach those, you peg those up about one to two inches from your hook. And it sounds crazy, right? But when they go and they suck in that bead with that little hook being right next to it, they're going to suck in the bead and they're just going to suck the hook in right with it so that's how you would peg those on it comes to hook selection here you want to use the biggest possible for the water conditions um like right there and they're a little bit bigger than uh like regular hooks because they're a thicker gauge uh, they're just a thicker gauge like steelhead like i believe these are sabers i want to say these are sabers or raven or red wings but those would be size eights those would be size tens size 12 and size 14 you know the clearer water the smaller the hook but make sure you you know get some steelhead brand hooks they're going to be a higher quality thicker gauge hooks um you know lots of different name brands you're going to figure out what's best for you and i do use a barrel swivel i use a heavier main line either i use a 12 or a 10 pound main line and then either with the 12, I would use a 10 pound floor leader. With a 10 pound floor uh, main line, I would use an eight pound floor leader. One, because if you get a snag, if you get a snag, you're not gonna lose your whole rig because your leader line is gonna be two pounds lighter. So you're at least gonna get your float back, you know? So you're, you're gonna lose a couple weights, the hook, but you'll at least get your float back, you know? Another thing guys like to drift with, you probably saw them in here, the, the jigs. Um, 
Those are just some feather jigs, marabou. Uh, the real fancy marabou jigs, guys really like them. Normally black, white, pink are the hot colors. Um, some guys do really well on them, especially in stained water. Uh, they even tip them with a couple maggots. Make sure that you get some with thicker gauge hooks though. You don't want uh, them to break off on them. See, that's tubing for my, uh, those are for my raven floats. And those are for my, uh, the swan, the loafer floats there. Also with the drift fishing, you know, I've seen guys tear them up on emerald shiners. Um, even a whole night crawler on a hook, just dangling a little bit. It depends on what they want, but I keep it simple, you know, eggs, beads. Don't really need anything else than that when you're drifting for them. It's, it keeps it real simple. Those are the two best things you could use for them. So I, I'm not even really, I got a couple jigs in there, but I'm not really carrying anything else. But when it comes down to float selection, see I got the Drennan, the 8 gram loafers. The gram is how much weight it can carry. You know, uh, when I load these up, just at top sticking up out of the water there and all this is down below um so when you're getting them the gram on it you can see that's eight gram is how much that weight can float you can see here's a couple raven floats for instance that's eight gram you can see that's a 15 in ohio eight gram is pretty much what you are going to use for our rivers it works out pretty well um, with a lot of weight in a cannonball, it can struggle a little bit. So if you're fishing like a really deep run or big cannonballs, 15 would be the highest you'd go. But it works out pretty, pretty well. You can see the tubing on there, too. Now you've probably seen these before. I remember the first time I saw these. And before I moved down to Florida, I saw one of these and I said, what the hell? Is that guy using this is called a center pin <clears throat> this is I got a while ago this is a matrix fully ported Raven right there um, on a Raven or what is this I am RV9 RV9 right there that's what I got this is a 13 and a half foot rod look at that now <clears throat> Why you really want to have such a long rod, main reason is for getting a drag-free drift. So when you just have your rod down like this, your line is going to grab in that current loop. And it's going to pull that float down so fast, unnatural. It's just going to grab it and go. Versus you're holding your rod up like this, and it's holding your line out of the water. And that float is moving down very slowly much slower and occasionally you got to mend it a little bit like this like you, you would with a fly rod but um, these long limber rods they help you get that good drag free drift that's really what you're going for because you want it to drift naturally slowly along the bottom and also when you're using such small hooks you know on the steelhead <laughs> these steelhead man they're they are some fighters you know so it really helps out with the flex on these uh steelhead when they're battling but these are pretty expensive setups um you don't necessarily need these but the reason why they i really like them so well is let me show you why here because look at that um you know when you're fishing on a spinning rod to let it drift down you gotta open the bail, close the bail, open the bail, close the bail, open the bail, close the bail. As it's slowly drifting down. And that can be kind of a pain versus this. Just a ball bearings in it, watch this. Just a tiny little tap. And it just goes with the, the speed of the river. You can just barely move it. And it just goes with the speed of the river. And you're gonna set that hook, your hands on it like this. You just, you got your finger touching it and you set that hook. And then you just reel them in. But that just lets you learning to cast them is a kind of a pain. You gotta pull the line out. I, I figured it out the first day, but I'm getting better at it. Not as accurate with the spinning, of course, but as you can see, while that's going down the river, it's just whatever wrong way. Whatever the speed of the river is, it's just turning with it. 
and giving it line and just keep your finger right there bam set the hook Besides that you don't have to get that they actually sell noodle rods uh, like this is a 11 and a half foot noodle rod right here i believe this is a cabela's one i got there the stratic there four thousand um see i got that rigged up as a backup there uh, you can get yourself one of those you don't got to spend the high dollars and, and you're going to get just as many fish on this it's just a little bit easier like i said using the center pin um but don't get smaller than a 10 foot hey, get yourself an 11 12 13 foot um, to get yourself that better longer drift and have that drag set accordingly too because these fish are really going to pull so let's say it's uh, end of September, October, November. I'm doing Lake Erie walleye shore casting and get a couple of them when I'm doing that. But um, I don't really go up there targeting them from shore. But if you wanted to go up to the break walls, you know, the harbors, you could cast, uh, you know, third, two third, or two fifths, you know, half ounce, three quarter little Cleos, kale wobblers. You know, in chrome, chrome blue, chrome green, chrome orange, you can cast those out and reel those in, and you'll get them from shore. Um, you could throw big rooster tails. Now, even in the spring, uh, remember I said earlier when those uh, males are making those reds and they're spawning, you can run <clears throat> a small rooster tail, 8th ounce, uh, 16th ounce, right across those. Oh, man, they will smack. Bam. I mean, they will smash them. You know, silver, hot pink, orange. Uh, they will smash them. And you could do that, too. So if you're just casting for them and you don't want to drift, that's what you do. But, you know, uh, drifting is just... It's just... <laughs> you can't beat it. It's just hands down the best there is. I think I about summed up uh, Lake Erie Steelhead 101. If you got any questions feel free to ask in the comments um hit me up let me know what you think anything i didn't go over feel free to ask except exactly where i'm fishing i'm not going to give you a ping uh, how many uh, questions i get where where it's, figure it out there's a lot of places out here there's a lot of public access on all these rivers it's not that hard to find uh you can get it down a lot of information out there uh Google Maps is your best friend. Help you find everything. Helps me out as a trucker a lot. But I think I'm about done for the day. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to catch no more fish. So anyways, um, yeah. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button if you watch a couple of my videos. I do a lot of realistic content. And uh, feel free to interact with my videos. How Fisherman Out. See you guys. I'll see you guys out here. I will.